Okay, uh, let's get started. Whatever it gives us here will be okay, I think. So as long as it is uh, recording. Uh, what uh, we are going uh, to do today is uh, uh, put into an application the theory that we developed in the last two lectures. Remember that we develop a theory for the uh, Boolean algebra uh, and uh, another theory for what we call the De Morgan algebra, which is a different kind of uh, 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 model for uh, dealing with the world around us uh, in general. So uh, today we take the uh, information, the theory that we developed in the Boolean algebra and the fuzzy De Morgan algebra and apply it to another method for the estimation uh, of risk. And uh, that would be a probabilistic approach. And uh, the name of the technique is fault tree analysis. But we are going to try to uh, hit or uh, catch two birds with one stone uh, in that uh, we are going to cover the idea of how to generate a fault tree uh, as a way of designing uh, systems so as we can minimize the risk or the probability of failure in that case, uh, both uh, from the probability theory aspects, uh, considering data that are measurable or observable, random variables as we call them, and uh, also from the perspective of a possibility theory, which we suggested is a different theory that does not just takes the end points of the unit interval or the, uh, or the uh, corners of a square or uh, like in the interpretation by Costco. But in that case, we deal with all the degrees by which a system can fail. Uh, a Boonial algebra, if we want to think about a failure of any engineering or social uh, or economic system, uh, describes it as a zero or one, meaning that it is totally failed or totally operational. The fuzzy approach considers all the degrees of membership. So you can have, for instance, a tire of a car that is not totally deflated or totally inflated, but maybe it has lost some air. So that is more uh, within the uh, uh, context of uh, 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 philosophies of the uh, Far East, uh, uh, where you have different degrees of hot and cold, the yin and the yang, and uh, Chinese and Indian and Japanese kind of uh, perspectives, whereas the Boonian algebra is more like the Western perspective, which is based on the theories of, or the philosophies of Aristotle, which is, uh, a algebra of absolute, something can be true, false, or false, and nothing in between. And we call this the law of the excluded uh, middle uh, in general. So let us uh, use this uh, theory to develop ways of describing a component that fails, and then expand it, not just uh, to describe a component that fails, but also to estimate the probability of the failure of a component, and from there, uh, the failure of complex systems. Uh, we cannot deal uh, with these complex systems with the algebra, differential, and integral uh, uh, algebra, like differential equations and uh, integral equations, but we have at our disposal the algebra of logic, and that's what we are going to do. Other people have used the algebra of logic also to describe complex systems, in the field of circuit analysis. You do not uh, go and calculate the currents and all the, the voltages in a complex circuit. You use the algebra of logic, the OR gate, the AND gate, and the NOT gate or the complementation gate uh, in general. So fault tree analysis depends on the algebra of logic. The, uh, we have an algebra, a set of points or set of values and then we apply on them two binary operations between two elements of the set, the OR operation, as well as the AND operation, and then one unary operation, which is the NOT or the uh, conjugate or the complement uh, in that case. Uh, 
so in that case, you'll see that uh, what we do is that we develop a system flow diagram. We try to describe the system to our best uh, knowledge and then translate it into a tree. Uh, and that's the same as a circuit and uh, uh, a circuit in an electrical system. And then we can propagate the uh, levels of error in the system and then come up with a number that tells me what is the probability of failure. Now, why do we do this? Because then we can improve on the system and uh, reach a level uh, at which the probability of failure is within the uh, limits that you would like that system to fail. You'll see that uh, we can always reduce the probability of failure of any engineering system by spending some money, maybe adding redundancy. Uh, a component is added, uh, but not in an arbitrary way. If you add uh, other components in an arbitrary way, we can increase the probability of failure rather than decreasing the probability of failure uh, in that case. All right, so let us uh, do here something interesting. Uh, this, uh, uh, in that case, uh, we try to uh, use the AND gate and the OR logic gates in describing a system. For instance, uh, if I have a system of two relays, you know that relays are, uh, are an electronic component that opens and closes or closes a circuit. And we want to describe whether the relay A is closed and uh, the relay B is also closed. And uh, in that case, we set up an end gate, an end logical gate, and we can conclude that that is no trip signal appearing out of the end gate. Notice that when you do fault tree analysis, we do not draw the diagrams horizontally like in circuit analysis. Always draw the diagram uh, vertically. And in fact, we'll see as we go along that the system uses what's called backward chaining uh, in computer programming uh, or in the algebra of logic, uh, it's also called uh, back, uh, backward chaining. We make a hypothesis here that I'm not receiving a trip signal in my, my uh, whatever uh, instrument or uh, uh, machinery that I am using. Trip meaning that shutting down, like you shut down, say, uh, the uh, power uh, release from a nuclear reactor, or uh, you shut down the engine on your car, and you start asking yourself a question, uh, what would I have caused that trip signal to occur? So you could see here that we make a hypothesis and then backward chain, we go back uh, in the logic and see what would have caused that trip signal not to occur. And uh, we, if you understand how the system functions, it could be that the relay A is closed and also the relay B is closed. We present that in a symbolic way by saying that A1, and this is the uh, symbol for uh, intersection, and he suggested that the intersection represents the end logical gate. Uh, or we can write it as A1 uh, with uh, an implied uh, product here, A1 multiplied into A2. Now, the idea here is not just to represent the system in its faulty condition, but also estimate the probability of that system uh, in terms of occurring, that no trip signal will occur. What is the number? the probability of this occurring. So that would be an application in an electrical system here. Now, we do not stop there. What we would like to know is what is the probability of that no trip signal to occur? Why? Because we can improve on the system. If uh, we had two relays that had to fail so that I do get it, one of them would work and give me a trip signal, or we could add a third one, but of course at the expense of spending some more money. So we, uh, we represent the system into uh, what we call here a fault tree, that's a fault tree. And the whole technique is called, of course, fault tree analysis. But I want to get a quantitative value, a number that tells me what is the probability as a number of no trip signal to uh, occur. All right, now we have to invoke here some of the knowledge from probability theory that we apply to the algebra of logic. So I want to estimate or calculate what's the probability of A1 
as I said here, there is an implied AND gate and A1, A1 and A2 occurring uh, uh, in that basically the two relays uh, do not uh, function correctly. In probability theory, if you want to calculate the probability of two events occurring with an AND gate here, both of them occurring, that's equal to the probability of A1 occurring given that that's a conditional uh, symbol here for that A2 occurs. So read this as a probability of A1 occurring given that A2 occurs multiplied by the probability of A2. Or you can write it in a different way. You can say that the probability of A1 and A2 occurring uh, is equal to the probability of A2 given that A1 occurs and then multiplied by the probability of A1. Now, if the probability of A1 conditional on A2 or given that A2 occur, uh, 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 it, it could be equal to the probability of A2 that being equal to the probability of A1 occurring. But what we uh, usually encounter is that A1 and A2 are independent of each other. So if that conditional probability does not occur the probability of A1 given that A2 occur and A1 and A2 are independent, we can approximate this by writing that it is equal to the probability of A1. And in the same way, the probability of A2 given that or conditional on A1 occurring, uh, that uh, if they are independent, uh, that is equal to the probability of A2. Now, why am I saying this? Because the condition uh, of uh, the development that we are going to make right here is that only if the two events are independent, uh, then uh, the, the conditional probability, which is very difficult to calculate, you cannot really estimate conditional probabilities easily. So we build the system intentionally such that A1 and A2 are independent of each other. And uh, that results with a simple law that uh, we apply from probability theory, that the probability of an A1 event that is independent of another event occurring, both of them occurring probability of A1 and A2 is the probability of A1 multiplied by the probability of A2. And uh, we have to remember that particular relationship. Uh, an example, uh, if you are throwing a die and uh, the probability of, uh, you're throwing two dice, and uh, you'll find that if uh, the probability of the one occurring and the probability of also the one occurring on the other uh, dice, that probability here is one six. The probability here is one six. So uh, we know that uh, to get the one, it's one six, one six. The probability of one and one, or what they call snake eyes, if you go to Las Vegas, all right, the probability should be one six multiplied into one six, which is one over 36. So you have on average to throw those two dice uh, 36 times to get that one and the one. Very simple law here. Uh, it doesn't teach you how to go to Las Vegas and gamble, uh, but uh, the people who develop probability theory uh, really developed the theory because they were trying to uh, win at uh, uh, games of chance, like in gambling, uh, to say it in a different way. And uh, if you have, uh, in general, not just uh, 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 two events occurring, and we have a very large number of events, then we can generalize that simple law here that the probability of A1 and A2 and A3 and A4 up to n number and different events, uh, if they are independent, remember here that independent uh, uh, condition is extremely important. If they are dep dependent, we really have to use those conditional probabilities. And that gets us into another field of uh, mathematics based theorem, uh, which we are going to uh, uh, basically bypass at the present time. So if the, all those events are independent of each other, oh, we simply remember the case of two dice, uh, you, uh, uh, you multiply the probabilities into each other. So can, can we remember that law, please? That is when you have two uh, events independent of each other, 
And uh, both of them occurring would be equal to the product of the two probabilities in that case. Now, the question comes out, what is the probability of uh, one or the other occurring? But before we get there, uh, we invoke the concept of possibility rather than probability. And you remember in possibility, the chapter on possibility uh, uh, theory, the, the Morgan algebra, uh, the uh, possibility of one event and another event occurring was always the minimum between the two possibilities. So here in probability theory, we take, and uh, that was described by the, uh, the Zade uh, diagram. I'll remind you of it here. I wish we had to use the board to be simpler. Okay, that's nicer here. If you have a probability, the membership of function mu sub a here, and you have the membership function of mu sub b here, uh, the uh, end event was the minimum between the two membership functions. So in that case, we can say that the possibility of an event occurring a one and another event occurring is the minimum between the two possibilities of the two events because they follow that Zade uh, diagram or the membership function in general. And we can also generalize that if you have more than one uh, event, uh, pi here uh, symbolizes the possibility, the P, capital P symbolizes a probability, then uh, in possibility theory, if you want the possibility of A1 and A2 and A3 and A sub N all the way, you will take the minimum provided that, again, they are independent of each other. So this is a very simple law that introduces you to the algebra of logic and probability theory and random variable. Now, I introduce to you first the, uh, uh, the end gate, uh, the end logical gate. Uh, how about the OR gate? Uh, what if we want to calculate the probability of some event occurring or another event uh, occurring? So in that case, this is uh, the OR logical gate represented here. For instance, we ask ourselves a question. Uh, you have a machine or a component of uh, in a circuit uh, where uh, CB stands for circuit breaker. Uh, basically, the circuit breaker is there in any electronic kind of uh, installation. So that if the current, uh, the uh, uh, exceed or the voltage exceeds certain unsafe values, uh, the circuit breaker opens up and uh, uh, prevents the current from damaging the rest of the piece of equipment. So in that case, we ask ourselves a question: uh, uh, What would cause uh, no circuit break uh, trip? And we see that uh, either that the circuit breaker failed, and that's a random failure event or there is no trip signal, the battery maybe has discharged, or there could be what we call a common mode failure event. If you have a fire, then of course, no signals are going to propagate in uh, the wiring. So the question is uh, how to estimate uh, the probability of an OR gate. Uh, and uh, the probability of OR gate is not uh, straightforward. You would think that it could be the summation of the probability of each one of them rather than the product, but in fact, if you think about the Venn diagrams, and here we invoke the Venn uh, diagrams, and uh, we said that A uh, is a set, that's probability theory, and B is a, another set, or actually all the points in that set here. And uh, when we estimate the probability of A, uh, it depends on a theory called measure theory, uh, and it's really the theory of integration, you'll find that the probability of A or B occurring are all the points that belong to A or to B or to both of them. So in that case, when I calculate the probability of A or B occurring, it's a probability of A plus the probability of B. But look here, that meniscus here uh, has been counted twice. And that meniscus is nothing than the probability of A and B occurring, right? All the points that belong to A and B at the same time. So we have to subtract from the sum of the probability of A plus the probability of B that 
once the probability of their intersection. So in that case, the law that we have to remember it a little more complex than the law for the end gate. It's the probability of A plus the probability of B minus the probability once of their intersection that we calculated earlier as the product of uh, uh, the probability of A uh, multiplied into the probability of, uh, uh, of uh, two uh, in that case. Now, again, the uh, condition that uh, this applies if, is that they're independent. And we are ignoring at this point the conditional probabilities because in that case, uh, as engineers, we cannot simplify uh, the design that we are using. We uh, have to design a system where the events are independent so that we can be able to predict uh, how they behave in general. If I have uh, a summation of more than two events, one A1 and A2, it is obvious that we are going to sum all the events, but then I have to subtract from those events uh, the intersections one at a time. And uh, I can give you an example if you have uh, three events here, A, uh, B, here A, here B, and here is C, that uh, basically uh, the probability of the three of them, the area, all of them is the probability of A plus the probability of B plus the probability of C minus the intersection of A and B minus the intersection of A and C once, only once, minus once the intersection of C and B. And then I have to add up uh, the uh, intersection of A and B and C, that little area there in the center. And if you have then more than uh, two events occurring, you add the probabilities and then you subtract uh, their occurrence two at a time, then you add their occurrence three at a time, and then you subtract and so on. And uh, in that case, uh, it becomes a little more complicated if you have more uh, than three events. I'll let you uh, prove it to yourself for maybe three events. Uh, that same equation uh, can be written in a simpler format other than that summation uh, format here from reliability theory, the probability of A1 or A2 or, or, or to F, what, AN uh, is one minus that symbol here, the capital Pi, is the product of one minus the probability of each one of them. And it's a, a fun thing to do to prove it to ourselves uh, uh, graphically, maybe for n is equal to three because we can handle that. But if you go to beyond three, it becomes quite complicated. So here we have a technique that can describe uh, when uh, components can fail uh, with the OR gate and uh, when uh, and not stop there, also calculate their probability of failure uh, in the OR sense, like one or the other or the other or uh, the, uh, the other. For instance, if you throw those uh, dice and you want to calculate the probability of getting uh, uh, one uh, or, uh, well, let's make it a six maybe to make it more meaningful. Ah, that pen does not work. Uh, so if you want to calculate, you throw two dice and then you want to get the probability of getting one or maybe yeah, here, uh, a six, the probability here is one six, this one one six, so you add the two probabilities and then you subtract the probability of both of them uh, occurring at the same time, which is at one over uh, 136. And uh, uh, assuming that the dice are not, well, they are not affecting each other, obviously they are independent uh, in, uh, in that case. All right, so here we have a technique now to estimate the probability of failure of uh, combination of components. Now, what if we are talking about possibility? Uh, in the case of possibility, when we dealt with the, the Morgan algebra, uh, the, uh, so that was here the uh, intersection of uh, mu uh, sub A intersected with u uh, sub B, that's a minimum. Uh, we said that in that case, uh, the maximum uh, was the uh, or gate. So in that case, 
this crosses here would be mu sub a uh, union. The union represents the maximum of occurrence of the two probabilities there. Notice that the maximum value in membership functions is the maximum value is one. And uh, in uh, probability theory, we are only dealing with the two extremes here, the zero and the one. But look here, we can get intermediate values at say uh, point, uh, point 0.5 here, it should be right here. Uh, the idea of the cup being half full or half empty. Uh, if uh, uh, at that point, if that's a height h and uh, 0.5 h here, and then one zero uh, h, uh, the cup can be half full and half empty to a degree of 50%. Probability theory only deals with the cup half full or half empty. So it's maybe a step function. Uh, either that the cup uh, is a little epsilon below half full or a little epsilon above half full, and but it cannot be half full and half empty. At the same time, what do we do with this? This is a paradox. We sweep it under the rug. And uh, remember the name for this is uh, law of the excluded middle. So possibility theory allows us to take all degrees of membership. It's a better representation of the world around us. Uh, but uh, the, pro the Boolean algebra, uh, is still very useful because it simplifies matter uh, as being zero or one only uh, in that case. So the possibility of A1 or A2 occurring is a maximum between the two possibilities uh, on the uh, Zade diagram, which are really those, the graphs of the membership uh, function. All right, now let us talk now uh, about not just one single OR gate and one single and gate. Uh, we know that uh, uh, engineering uh, uh, components and engineering devices are much more complex than having one single component. So what happens if we have multiple components? And in that case, we can model those multiple components by having combinations of OR gates and AND gates. Let us remember the Boolean algebra of events. Again, uh, we suggested the commutative law applies. Uh, and uh, uh, when you put the plus sign, we know now why we use a plus sign, because when you put the plus sign, you're representing the OR gate. So you know that the, you sum the probabilities and uh, when you leave it to, without, or you can put a period here, uh, this represents the end gate. So I'm saying here, X and Y is equal to Y and X. That is a commutative law. Uh, let us take the idempotent law x uh, and x itself is equal to x and x or x gives me back also x so that idempotence and uh, we have the law of complementation all the 10 laws uh, applies in a boolean algebra except that let's come back to boolean algebra here uh, in that law of the excluded middle here of the complementation law it tells us that x and its opposite or its complement is equal to zero, meaning that something and its opposite cannot coexist. That's Aristotelian logic again, uh, the uh, law of uh, absolutes. And when you take the X or its complement, uh, you get the universal events and it has to happen basically either something or its opposite. And if you take the complement of the complement, you get back X, uh, uh, the initial uh, uh, function in that case. Uh, that allows us to, of course, deal with the De Morgan theorem that I ask you to try to prove it yourself uh, the, uh, uh, graphically. In possibility theory, uh, the difference between a Boolean algebra, I'm repeating here some important uh, concepts, uh, that uh, uh, law of the uh, complementation law, we cannot say that X O and its opposite cannot coexist. In that case, you find that something and its opposite is not necessarily equal to zero. Like that point here in the middle of the graph, it's at 0.5, not at uh, zero. And X uh, or its complement is not necessarily equal to the uh, universal set. So we have two bodies of knowledge, one that we like to call probability theory, based on observations and measurements, 
random variables, as we call them, and a De Morgan algebra or a fuzzy logic or possibility theory depends on modeling systems and uh, uh, not necessarily observing them. And in that case, we can deal with situations that are not just the corners of the unit cube or the uh, unit uh, hypercube in general. All right, so how can we use this to describe complex systems? Uh, it's uh, partly an art and partly a science. So we have to learn uh, both. So in that case, we start by constructing a full tree that describes a complex system. So like in drafting, we have to have some conventions and the conventions in that case are shown in that uh, uh, diagram here. Uh, we use a circle to represent an independent primary fault event. Oh, the, cir the circuit breaker uh, doesn't trip, it doesn't work. A rectangle would be a fault event is the result of the logical combination of many other events. And of course, we have the binary operations. The OR gate is represented with that, uh, what looks like an arrow. Uh, the AND gate looks like more like a puck. And uh, when these uh, uh, fault trees that I will look at in a moment uh, become too complex, uh, what do we do? We draw them on a large sheet of paper and then we exit or enter into another sheet of paper. You'll find that, that uh, nuclear power plants, uh, they would have uh, whole trees on how the, all the components are interacting with each other uh, right uh, behind the desk of the, uh, basically the uh, people who are conducting the control of the plant so that they can see the interconnection between the different uh, uh, components. And uh, we learned the whole thing by using uh, an example. So let us see here how we construct a full tree for uh, what we call a latch mechanism. So this is a latch mechanism. You have basically, this is called a latch that keeps that little uh, component here from dropping down uh, through gravity. And to make sure that uh, uh, when you pull it this way, uh, the latch here will release that uh, little uh, uh, board, let's say, uh, down, uh, you add two uh, control systems. One uh, that uses hydraulic control. And you know that hydraulic control, if you see it in construction equipment or farm equipment, they use basically hydraulic cylinders. Uh, how does a hydraulic cylinder function? Again, I keep using the bad one. <laughs> a hydraulic uh, cylinder works this way. Uh, uh, you have basically a cylinder. So let's think this. Uh, as a cylinder, and uh, you have in that cylinder uh, inside it, uh, uh, actually a cylinder with a ram here. Uh, and uh, if you bring in uh, pressure here, actually also how brakes work, you bring in oil here, and then you let the oil, in that case from your brakes exit this way, then you push that cylinder here in this direction and that arms move in this direction. Do you know that? I have seen these hydraulic cylinders. If you haven't seen them, look at construction equipment, how they move the arms by applying pressure of oil. So you pump the oil, you move that arm this way or that way, and you can generate a quite a bit of pressure depending on the area of that cylinder. Very little uh, application. Oh, that's how our brakes work on cars. Uh, uh, brakes act this also this way, the hydraulic, oh, and airplanes uh, that fly using hydraulic controls rather than wire, flying by wire, uh, also use this technique. So you apply a little pressure from your uh, foot, uh, you move the oil here that pushes the brakes and opens them to brake and stop your car. Uh, if you do not have that uh, kind of a hydraulic control system, uh, you still have your brakes work, but you have to put in much, much, more pressure in the case of an emergency. So this is basically a hydraulic cylinder here, uh, and uh, it's controlled by the oil coming in and coming out. So we call it hydraulic control A. And uh, for redundancy or reliability, we are not just depending on one of them, we are using two of them. Uh, so in that case, uh, if one fails and the other one is available to pull that latch and let this big, uh, uh, latch basically fall down through gravity. Now, something important, why do I use that example? 
because that represents the control rod in a nuclear reactor. If you have a nuclear reactor and you want to shut down the chain reaction, you insert the control rod into it and uh, it can fall through gravity by having a simple control like this latch mechanism. Uh, we can see later that you can have an analog uh, or a similar device that uses relays and uh, uh, basically magnets and uh, linear induction motors to pull uh, that latch mechanism and get the control rods to fall into the core of a reactor, shutting uh, the chain reaction. So the question is how do we design such a system so as we achieve a certain level of safety? Uh, or the, in that case, the probability of failure is minimized to a degree that is acceptable to us without spending uh, too much money. So you find that uh, we start by making, uh, a di uh, drawing a diagram of how that latch mechanism functions. And as I suggested, this is what we call backward chaining. And uh, backward chaining is uh, uh, dependent uh, in um, um, mathematically, as you'll see in a moment, on what we call deductive logic. We use deduction. We have learned about induction in mathematics and deduction. So let's use deduction in that case. We make an assumption here that the latch here, here that latch does not trip, meaning that it doesn't let the control rod fall into the core of the reactor and shut down the chain reaction. In that case, I'll have an accident because the power is not uh, controlled. And uh, the logic here says that either that the linkage fails, uh, fails in the extended mode and we put in an OR gate or the actuators here, those two actuators fail to retract. All right, fine. So this is uh, a basic event here and that is an event that can uh, be uh, some kind of uh, expanded more. So in the drafting uh, uh, terminology, the rectangle is a fault event. It is usually the result of the logical combination of other events. So we see here now, what are the other events that can cause uh, my actuators to fail to retract and bring in the control rod to shut down uh, the chain reaction in my uh, reactor? And uh, it's very obvious that uh, we have uh, uh, implemented already in that system some form of reliability. Uh, if one of those actuators fails, the other one should be there to substitute for it. So the actuators are going to fail if both the uh, hydraulic cylinder A and hydraulic cylinder B fail. So you could see now that we don't use the OR gate, we use an AND gate. And uh, in that case, actuator A fails to retract uh, and actuator B fails to retract. Now we can also expand on that actuator B fails to retract and actuator A fails to retract by suggesting that actuator A fails to retract if the actuator fails in the extended mode or the hydraulic uh, control A fails in the expanded uh, mode. So in that case, uh, the cylinder there is not moving. Maybe the uh, oil is not moving from one side to uh, the other. And the same uh, situation for the actuator B, and this would be a basic fault event. This would be a basic fault event. Uh, if the event can be expanded in further, described further, we use the diamond shape kind of uh, 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 geometry. And uh, this is here the diamond. Uh, the fault event is not fully developed as it's to its causes. It is only an assumed primary fault event. So in that case, we can expand on that fault tree if we have more information about how my system functions. So you could see here, it doesn't just depend on using a simple gate or a simple component, only the latch mechanism, it can deal with as complex a system that you can want to deal with. And uh, definitely we do not depend here on the flow rate of the oil and so on. We describe it with the algebra of logic and OR gate here and an AND gate here and then two OR gates here. Now that is not sufficient for us to deal with that system. We want to design it to a level where the probability of failure is within uh, some uh, uh, range that is acceptable to us as engineers. Uh, so you could think for instance, oh, let us add another uh, link mechanism here so that if those two fail, 
then you can add the third one here. But of course, it will cost us money. Uh, the design of the system will need more components and you pay money for more components. So we must, must be able to calculate the probability of failure. If we know the probability of failure of those latch mechanism and those hydraulic uh, cylinders. So we want to quantify that fault tree that we developed here. And uh, in that case, uh, uh, we can do a, uh, an estimate of the probability of failure. So let us do that uh, numerically on that example. Let's assume that the probability of failure of B is 0.1, 10%. Uh, the probability of failure of C is also 10%. D 10%, E 10%, and the probability of failure of A is uh, 1%. And we ask ourselves a question, what's the probability of failure of the whole system here? Do you see that? The probability of failure of the whole system can be calculated here graphically. So here we have an OR gate. Oh, we just wrote on the board that when you have a probability, uh, and let us assume that the uh, intersection uh, in the equation that we wrote for the OR gate uh, is very small. So in that case, we add the two probability of failure. So you add 0.1 to 0.1, the probability of failure of their combination is 0.2. And uh, you, if you add the probability of failure of D uh, or uh, the failure of E, oh, it adds up to 0.1 plus 0.1 because that's an OR gate. We add the probability is 0.2. Now those two enter into an AND gate. So the probability of failure of these two here, because they're entering an AND gate, is not the sum of the probabilities of failure anymore. It's a product of this failure probability into that failure probability. So that's now 0 0.04, and we know that this is 0 0.01, and that these are both entering an AND gate to the top event, and the probability of failure of the whole device there is 0 0.05. Now think uh, uh, if we had only one of those two components, this one was not there, you'll find that in that case, the probability of failure would be that 0.2 here, uh, plus the 0.01, the probability of failure would be 0.21. But the fact, so that's 21% failure probability, but because we added that extra uh, component here for redundancy, I, a probability of failure has been reduced from 21% to 5%. And an interesting exercise is what will happen if you add a third component right here. You'll find that you'll have 0.2 multiplied into 0.2 multiplied into another 0.2. So that would be 0 0.00, uh, uh, no, uh, uh, 0 0.2, 0 0.4, uh, yeah, 8, 0 0 0.008. And then when you add, the so, two, that's 0 0.018, and the probability of failure is not 5%, but maybe only 0 0.02. However, uh, we know here that we have to spend money adding that extra component. So it's a matter of optimizing our system so that we don't spend too much money, reducing the probability of failure by a small amount. But you could see immediately that the full tree now describes to me, uh, the pro quantifies the probability of failure in a system that is complex, uh, you can have maybe actually hundreds of components here in a single device. And they invite you maybe to uh, draw a full tree for the operation of your bike or your phone or your computer and so on. Now, this is very interesting. We are solving the problem here graphically, but uh, can we, uh, what if uh, we have now hundreds of components uh, it doesn't become very useful to use a graphical representation. We need to put it on a computer. Uh, to put it on a computer, we have to uh, describe that fault tree in an analytical way. And in that case, we call that representation analytically as a Boolean expression uh, of the tree. And in that case, when we deal with the Boolean expression, uh, we can program it on a computer and deal with much more realistic and complex system. So in that case, let us see how we derive a Boolean expression for that tree. So we go back to our diagram here and uh, we denote each one of those events, the A's, the small B's, the small A, uh, as uh, a given event. So the linkage failed in the extended mode is A, the actuator fails in the extended mode is B, C, the control element fails, 
D, the actuator B fails, E, the control element fails. So this is now uh, A, B, I could see here, A, B, C, D, and E. Now, the, uh, these are primary events, but uh, secondary events is now the A, the top event the, the, that we want to calculate, uh, the C, uh, the small b, and the small d. So let us start with the A. Uh, what is A? A on the diagram is capital A. Let's look here at the diagram. Cap, uh, A, let's start with small a. Small a is this one here. It's the OR gate between capital A and small b. So we write down that uh, uh, small a is a, and the plus here uh, is not an addition. It's an OR gate. All right. So and then we can write for C uh, the event C here in the diagram as being the OR between B uh, or C. And so we write for a small C that it is uh, B, uh, C or B. Now in the diagram itself, you'll find that small b is a product of C and D. So we write that uh, small b is a product and gate between uh, C and D. That's a small b here, an end gate between C and D. Now we have the expression for C and D, so we can determine what is B. And if we have B, we can determine what is A. Uh, in a uh, algebraic form. And this is what basically we call the Boolean expression for the tree. So A here is A or B. We take the B here, that's C, D. And then the C itself is B or C. And the uh, D is uh, D or E. And the two of them, C and D, have an uh, end gate in between them. Notice that uh, this is a Boolean expression, so it uh, should obey. Uh, the 10 laws of a Boolean algebra. So we can use a distributive law if you want. So you say, can say that A or B or C and D or E. Notice how I'm reading it. It's the same as A, and then you distribute B uh, and D or B and E or C and D or uh, C and E. So this is another way of writing that expression. And uh, you can expand it further because we said that when you have an AND gate, oh, oh boy, be patient with me here. I, uh, the mouse played a trick on me. Uh, remember that we are not just interested in the Boolean expression, but that's what we can enter into a computer program. Uh, and uh, now we have B and D. I'm interested what is the probability of A. Whenever I have an OR gate, we said that we add the probabilities. Whenever we have an AND gate, multiply the probability. So that in that case, the probability of A, if I want to calculate the probability of A, is the probability of A uh, plus the probability of B and D, which is the product between the two, because that's an AND gate here, or the product of the two, B and E, or the product of C and D, or the product of C and E. And notice something interesting here, that we can represent the same logic uh, that I have shown in that form here, but by using the algebra of a Boolean algebra, basically the 10 laws, I can also represent it in this other way. Now, if you go and plug the probabilities in the, uh, the uh, graphical diagram, uh, you'll find that, oh, we get 0.01 plus 0.01 square, 01 square, 01 square, 01 square. Oh, we get the same result as we get from the graphical description, but the advantage is that we can put it on a computer program. In the same way that we can deal with probabilities, we can deal with possibilities. Uh, in that case, the uh, end gate at the top is, uh, the, the OR gate at the top is a maximum between the possibility of A, the possibility of B and D, the possibility of B and E, and each one of those possibility B and E, C and D, C and E is a minimum between the possibility of B and the possibility of D. So in that case, if we know if we take that again, the possibilities are the same values as the probability just for the sake of uh, demonstration, uh, you'll find that I can uh, substitute the maxima between the values for uh, the minimum between 0.1 and 0.1. The minimum would be an end gate, an end gate, an end gate, an end gate here. And uh, the total possibility of that whole component failing 
is the maximum between 0, 0.1, 0 0.1, 0 0.1, 0. So the maximum possibility of failure is 0.1. Notice here that the possibility is larger than the probability of failure of the uh, different components. Now, why do we do this? Because here we can get numbers for the probability and the possibility. And in that case, we can also uh, put that into a computer program for a system that may have a system, uh, hundreds of components. Uh, we leave the dealing with more complex systems for uh, next time. And I hope that uh, the whole system has uh, uh, really recorded uh, the lecture.